Hey everybody, it's Kate Quinn. Welcome back to Free Motion Fridays with Kate. And today we're gonna just talk a little bit about the quilting process and preparing your sandwich in order to get different results that you might find valuable. So I've got a couple of pieces of batting. I'm gonna scoot this up really quick so we can show you some things. So this piece of batting is um, Hobbs Tuscany Heirloom Wool. And it's beautifully carded in the sense that there's no um, debris in the wool. So the wool's very, very, very clean. And that's something that I like about that. And then look how thick it is. So other, some other products that I've tried, I've used Pelon Wool. It's 100% wool but it's mixed wool, so from different things. So basically they probably have got, you know, a little bit of leftover wool from this kind or that kind, and they cart it all together, and it's thinner than this. It's maybe about half as thick. This is quite thick, and this is the Hobbs Tuscany Heirloom Wool. So I really like this. If I'm going to use this, this is warm. It's a natural fiber. It breathes really well. It's very flexible. It's got a nice drape, but it holds its shape pretty well. And so if I use something like this, I'm gonna get a natural loft with it. One thing that's unique about wool is that wool um, will puff back up. So, you know, it kind of retains its shape and its loft over time. And a lot of people think that wool is really hot I, I don't think it is. I think, you know, if you use a thinner wool than this, you could even use it as a summer weight. It just breathes very well. So it's very comfortable in that sense. And it's going to give that puffy loft when you quilt it, especially if you have light, medium, and heavy quilting. You're going to get amazing density with something like this. So then here's another example. This is actually warm and white. And you can see it's very thin. So this is going to give sort of that very flat, nice, easy look to it. This is not gonna create a tremendous amount of texture just by itself with something like that. It's, it's pretty thin and it'll quilt up nicely. The needle, the hand, the feel of it is really great. It's nice and soft, but you're not gonna get a lot of texture. Even if you do a lot of different levels of quilting, if you do light, medium, and heavy quilting, this is not gonna show that much, right? This is so thin. One thing to think about is if you're using vastly different colors of thread, like black on one side and white on the other side, the knot of your thread needs a place to hide. The thinner that your batting is, the more difficult that will be. So this type of batting that's so thin will be a little bit more difficult to hide that different color. So it's going to be more dotty if you use a super thin batting like this. One thing to note about this, this is actually white batting. And let me just put a colored batting next to it so you can see the difference. See that? If I'm using a white fabric, typically I would want white underneath. So if I really wanted to layer something, these might be a good option to get the white underneath your white fabric, but still get that bi-level texture. And then if you add those together, notice that you're gonna have a lot more room for your knot to be hidden. So when we start layering battings, we wanna think about what thickness do we wanna have? What weight do we wanna have? And you know, we don't want any debris. For example, if we had wool that had little like stickery things in it, you know, it's not that it's pokey, but there's, but you can see if the quality is better, it's not gonna have anything in it. Whereas wool that is not carded as well might have some little stuff in it. And that would definitely show through on a white. So this would be a nice combination that would get you that amazing texture, but it would definitely show through as white. And that would be a way that you could get the loft that you wanted, but have the color interplay that you want also. So let me show you a couple of other things. This is the warm uh, and natural cotton, and this is the warm and white, right? So both of these are pretty much the same loft, 
right? They're both thin, you can see that, but you could always double these up as well, right? So um, somebody just asks about how do I launder it if it has a wool? So this is actually washable wool, if you can believe that. Um, so it says on the package that you would launder it. The way that I wash a quilt anyway is I try not to wash it unless it's dirty, like a spill or really sticky. I can spot clean it. But if you put a quilt in the wash, it's it has a lot of agitation if you run it on a regular cycle. And I don't prefer that. So I actually have the clean and soak um, and I would put the quilt in the bathtub and just let it soak overnight and then I rinse it. And I'm gonna wash it, um, I mean, uh, get the water out of it. So like if this was the quilt, I'm gonna take it up out of the bathtub and put it in the laundry basket and tip the laundry basket to let it drain. And then I'll kind of smush it down, squeeze it, press it, you know, gently to get excess water out of it. Then I would layer some towels over it and I'm gonna roll it up in a towel like this. Okay, so that the towel is between each layer and then kind of press it like this to get all the extra water out of it so it's not dripping wet. And that may take a few towels, like use some old beach towels that are clean but have a very good absorbency. And then what you can do is you can lay the quilt out and let it dry. And I'll usually put it over uh, maybe some chairs, like um, your outdoor chairs that are clean. What you want is you don't want to just lay this down on something, especially because number one, it'll get that wet because it's obviously wet on both sides, but you want some air underneath the quilt. And then you could maybe run a fan on it, which would help improve the air circulation. And what that does then, since you put it in the bathtub, you might stir it up or whatever, but it's going to remove um, sweat, salt, body odor, any kind of stains like that, natural stains. Um, you can also use woolite, anything that doesn't require a tremendous amount of rinsing and agitation. You want something that is very soluble. The soap should be really soluble. And a lot of products are designed for quilts. So like the Clean and Soak is from Retro Clean, and that works really well. And then, you know, when we let it soak in the laundry basket, what we don't want to do is take this heavy, wet quilt and lift it up and strain all those stitches. So by putting it in the laundry basket and tipping the laundry basket, it lets all that excess water drain out. So then the quilt, you know, relieves some of that pressure. It lets you then move it around. So kind of squeeze it, get that excess water out, and then you can let it dry that way. So that's going to be a little bit better. It's not going to provide as much um, stress on the quilt and on the stitches, especially when they're wet. So hopefully that was helpful. Okay, and let me show you the last one. The last piece of batting that I have, this is a mix. This is 80-20, and just the feel of it is different. You can see it's, it's not as drapey. You know, it kind of is a little stiffer. The poly is holding its shape a little better. Um, this is easy care great for baby quilts or heavy use quilts. Something that is going to be um, still flexible, but it's going to wash and wear a little bit better in the sense that if you're going to have to wash the quilt, like a baby quilt's going to be washed a bunch of times. You know, we all know that. You're not going to be able to maybe save that until they're giving it down to their kids. It's not an heirloom. It's a use product. So this kind of um, product is a little bit more wash and wear friendly, definitely heavy use, you know, and I'm going to comment real quick on baby quilt quilting. A lot of us want your baby quilt to be soft and drapeable. And I remember I quilted the tar out of my son's kindergarten nap quilt, right? And he hated it because it wasn't soft. Well, wash it a few times and put some fabric softener on there because that quilt looks perfect today. It's still used and it is still in excellent condition because it was quilted the tar out of it. And then my older son had this really soft drapey quilt that my aunt made for him and it's awesome. And it totally was worn to shreds because it wasn't quilted as well. So what happens when you quilt it really densely, what you're doing is all of these layers then are going to move as one. The more quilting that you have, this is gonna move as one. If we only quilt it a little bit, 
all these pieces are going to move separately and they're going to cause more and more strain against the stitching. So even for a baby quilt, you might want to consider if that's a quilt that you've worked on really hard and it's really cute and you think that you want them to have it for a long time, maybe quilt it up a little bit more. Um, doesn't have to be, you know, cardboard quilted, but you know, a little bit more is a big difference between a very super softly draped quilt something like that. And especially if it's for mom and baby, you know, it's bigger, you want a little more quilting on there so that quilt can sustain over time. Okay, that's a lot of talking. Let's, let's look at these items. So I have always recommended top stitch or quilting needles and Schmetz has both of these products. And right now I'm gonna put a silk thread on and I have a hundred weight uh, in the bobbin uh, 80 weight in the bobbin and 100 weight silk in the top and it's white thread in the bottom and it's going to be this kind of aqua color let's see if i can show you here we'll put this up here so you can see it so it is colored just barely there's a little bit of blue right there so it's a teal color and i'm going to put that in and we're gonna quilt with that. And in order to do that, I took out my 9014 needle and I put this 8012 in there because that thread is so fine. Now I can use my needle threader for the 8020, but I'm gonna probably thread it by hand. And these are the two different needles that we have. So I'll kind of put them up. You can see that the difference in the eye is pretty dramatic between the two of them, right? I mean, look at how big one is compared to the other. And then the groove is also bigger. So the groove right here in the shaft of the needle, the thread is supposed to actually ride in the groove. And what that does with your top stitch and quilting needle, if you think about it, if this is the groove and the thread is in it, the thread is protected by the needle. The needle's actually protecting that thread from abrasion because the edges of the groove are what are passing through the fabric. So it's going to prevent shredding, thread breakage, but we need to make sure that we use the right size needle. If I have a very fat thread, maybe like a 30 weight, and I put a 9014 needle on, what that means is that if this is the groove, if the thread is riding outside of the groove because it's so fat and it can't get in there, then the thread is not being protected. So we want to choose the right needle size for the thread that we're using. I could potentially even use a little bit finer needle like a 7511, but I think this 80 is going to work. So I wanted to just show it to you. I'm going to go ahead and put it in. Schmetz has a little color coding right here. So this has got the chrome and then the size. So I like Schmetz because that way you can always tell what size you're using. Some of the other ones may not always have that information right there available for you. So you'll have to just keep track of them. Have a little piece of cardboard where you note what your size is. And then when you take a needle out and you know what it is, make sure you put it back on that card if you want to reuse it. So make sure your needle's all the way up. If your needle isn't all the way up, what you might see is that your needle would hit your bobbin case because it might extend down a little far if it's not all the way seated. And that is a recipe for thread problems. That's not that common, but if you actually look up in there, many machines will have a little needle stop at the top. And you can physically look at that and see if your needle is touching the needle stop. So it has like a little bar. And if there's a gap, then you know your needle's not up all the way. But then if you put it up to the needle stop, then you know it's seated all the way up. Okay, all right, so let's get threaded up. So we've got our thread and it's so fine, I can't even find it. <laughs> I'm using those horrible glasses that have not yet been fixed because I have been out of town, so I haven't been able to go and get them adjusted. So I got new trifocals and that center position, I can't quite find it what I need. All right, let's see if we can do it. Oh, did it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's hilarious. Ride it down the groove if you can. Just let it follow the groove. And a lot of times it'll just go right in there. Let me try one more thing. I'm gonna get my, oh, my tweezers. Tweezers are really helpful. If you have trouble threading, these guys can be super helpful. I learned that as a serger technique 
because my serger teacher, she was like, oh, here, use this. Oh, got it. Perfect. Went in the first time. Okay, so that's a good trick for you. Also, if you have a piece of white paper and you can put it behind your needle, it accentuates that opening. So if you need that, then you can also use that as a way to tell that you've got your needle threaded up. So let's just test it real quick. Just like we've always talked about, I'm gonna just put the needle down and up. We're gonna pick up our bobbin thread. It's really short right there, but it's there. And then if your thread is on top of your needle like this, I don't like that. So let me show you a little trick real quick. Pick up the needle so you can move, but don't pull on the thread and just pull this and then you can pull that top thread right through that foot. So if you ever have that situation happen and you want that thread on the back um, under the foot, that's what you can do to get it under the foot. Okay, let's test it real quick. So this is that smaller needle and both of these threads are very, very fine. So I always do a little test just to make sure that my tension is good. You would think that you would need a lower tension sometimes when you have very fine threads like this that are 100 or 80 weight, but I have found that's not always the case. Sometimes you actually need the tension to be higher, and I don't understand exactly what the mechanics of that is, but there is the look right there on the top. So let's put a little more light right there so we can see it better. Right, so that's the top, and then let's flip it over, and I don't see any problem. I don't see any thread, you know, colored thread sticking out. This is just the white, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and just sew with that. I think that looks good. And for me right now, my tension number, if you want that, is about 4.8, which is a little higher than normal. Somewhere between three and four is what I normally do. And this is just a little bit higher than that. And that is what seems to be working. It can also be a function of the fact that the needle hole is smaller so that's another aspect. Sometimes if we're using the wrong uh, needle, then the hole itself isn't big enough for the thread to be pulled up. So if I was using this 80 and I had a 40 weight thread, I could automatically have some thread issues with tension because the hole itself that the needle is making may not be big enough for the thread to come up. So then you raise your tension, you raise your tension, you raise your tension. Well, it still doesn't fix the problem because the needle size is not accurate. Okay, so really important to check that you're using the correct balance of those tools. Okay, so I changed my thread color to this cream. I didn't want it to be super whitey white as we're trying to do some fills in here. So I've got a couple of um, different spaces that have some designs that I've put in from a class that I did. And what I wanted to do is, for example, we've got um, this open area, which will puff up nicely. And then we've got these two slots. In this area, if I micro stitch right in this channel between these two, we're going to make this puff a lot more. And right now I've got two of the 80-20 poly um, layers in there. So you can see this is a little bit fatter. And let me show you an example here real quick. So this is single layer, but a little bit fatter. Right, that's not two layers, but it, the batting itself is a little bit thicker than what we're using right now. And so this is the look that this has. It's a little bit puffy because it's a poly. So it's, it's kind of sticks up a little bit. You get that a um, little bit loftier. So you get a nice puff on it, but let's see what we're gonna get with this two layers. And we're just gonna compress this little channel right here and then the function of that is we're talking about a very fine thread because this is a very, very small space. So we're gonna just do a little micro quilting. And I think let's go this way and then we'll kind of come over and do something in there, I guess. So this thread is gonna hide very well and that makes it really easy to travel if we need to. And something that you can do with the double is you can also try to echo this area. So say we wanted to really condense this whole space. One of the things that is useful is if we can 
actually outline the area that we want to work in before we start. So I'm going to actually come in. This is double stitched right here, but we can actually sneak right along this line with this thread. Because it's so fine and it's blue tinge, it can actually go right along the line. And we do want pretty fine stitching in this area. So don't worry if we're adding quite a few stitches in there. It'll all work out. Nobody will even really see it because it's going to hide pretty well. So I'm just following the line nice and slow. I want to get right on the inside because I'm trying to really punch this down and close this space. So let's just go ahead and we'll just start micro tacking now. So I'm going to speed up. I find it really hard to micro tack well when you're just going super, super slow. What actually happens is your needle traps you. It actually cannot advance out of the quilt fast enough to keep up with your movement if you're sewing really slow. So then you're pushing against it, but the needle is actually pinning you in place. So then you can't move freely. So let's go ahead and go a little faster here. We're just gonna ramp up quickly to that right speed. Notice that I just changed my hand position. So I've got a little bit more grip right there so that I can get right in there. This is allowing me to pull and then I can get right down to the bottom and transition to this other space. So just go over those existing stitches. I'm going all the way down to the bottom where this little dip is. And then we'll just go ahead and we'll sew right along, just like we did the other side where we echoed around that. What that's doing is really punching down this piece all the way, making sure that this is completely closed right around this area. And if it didn't quite hit where I wanted to, I can just go back. This is all gonna hide pretty well. They'd have to look really, really tightly to see this. So let's get my little gripper back. Once it starts to open up, I can kind of advance around a little bit and kind of come back on some areas. When it's so small like that, you're going to have to just let it kind of stack on itself a little bit. And what's nice with this silk thread is because it is so fine, if you miss a spot, you can just wiggle your way back over there and just put some more stitching in there and it'll still work out. This kind of hides really well. I mean, they really would have to get out a little microscope to see if you crossed over or anything like that. And if you crossed over, who cares? Nobody will be able to tell. This will hide really well. Okay, so can you see the difference? I did try to use some color. So this is actually a little bit tighter than this. So I think I might go back next time and I'll go back over there. What happens here, the reason why it's different is this is not warmed up and this is warmed up and that's what happens. We tend to get a little bit more comfortable, a little free in our motion as we go. And at the same time, if we quilt for a really long time, we get tired also at the end of the day. So what you might see is some changes between your quilting from when you start to when you end. So you gotta kind of manage that a little bit, maybe practice on a scrap, get your movement ready, and then start working on your project. So um, let's go ahead and we're gonna scoot over to this one and we're gonna put like some little circles around this and kind of create a little frame in this space right here. So if we want to make them kind of have a little spacing guide, one of the things that we can do with this is we can take our ruler, let's see where mine is, and we can put the little marking in there to tell us what we need. So I guess I'll actually scoot over here and just come back so I can actually draw my line in. Went a little bit too far before I thought about it. Okay. Let's create a little space for our circle. So they're very small 
and this is just going to help keep them a little bit even. I'm not worried about if I go over the line. The line's going to go away, but it's just going to be a visual guide. This is useful if you have trouble controlling your space and, and can't make the designs the way you want them. Putting a little boundary can be really great to help you get that. So let's put a little circle. Again, go a little faster. Don't go so slow. Little circles, figure eights. Make sure that when you adjust your hand position, your needle is stopping. So right here, we might want to put a little bigger one in. And if we want to go all the way down to the bottom, we'll put a little baby one right there. And then let's come up to the top. Now we can follow that guide again. So I'm looking ahead a little bit to see how many more. I want to fit maybe two in there. And then I can just scoot over right there. So I can put some little frame in there and I can even put that echo in there if I want to. Let's go ahead and we're, we'll jump stitch over. This already has a nice little frame. So let's put some just little like curly cues or something in there. So in order to hop over, we'll just get to the boundary. That way, when we move over to here, I can just do some tack stitching right in this area. And we can do any kind of traveling in here that we want. So I got a little area right there that isn't quilted in. So I'll just travel back to there in a minute. I'll just put one more right there. So right in this spot right here, this is where the gap is right there. So I'm just gonna come back up this way and I'll fill that in. And brings me right out to the boundary and then I can just tack off. Right up here too, there's like a little gap, so let's go ahead and go up there too. And I'll just put a little curly in there. And then we'll tack it off. It. So this gets to be like a little frame and that's the little window inside there. So that's all we have for today. I didn't have a ton of quilted spaces. Let me turn it over though. I'll show you. I got a little bit of thread on the top from the ruler work, but this is the white. Let's see. Can you see it? We'll flip it down a little bit so you can see it. So this is no color value, right? So when we use that white on white, what we get is a lot of texture, but we don't necessarily get a lot of information about the design, right? This is just showing, you can really see the puff right here with this all pushed down and how this has a really defined space. And then we just have a little texture here with the circles. And this was right there. I gotta trim those little tails. Those are from the initial quilting design, because those are both blue, right? But I think it looks cute. Can you see the texture right there if I kind of shadow it a little bit? So you get this frame around that and then that's compressed. So that's how you can use different quilt battings. 
there's, um, there's no rule. You can layer whatever you want in order to create the elements that you want. One thing to just think about is, you know, we talked about washability. Um, you want to talk about quality. If your quilt, if you know it's not going to last and you don't care, then you don't have to use really expensive batting. You can just enjoy the wear life while it lasts. But more quilting is going to make it last longer and better quality batting is going to increase its wearability over time. And then always make sure that your needle is matching the thread that you need to use. So those are kind of the tips that I am identifying for today. Um, let's see, I'm sure changes the whole, it does, doesn't it? Especially like this one, you can really tell right there. And this one, I, I think I might wanna go back in and put that line in there to make the circles be more emphasized. But just that little bit, you know, I think sometimes when we do quilts, we, we want that bi-level, but we just don't know where to put it in. So maybe if you could just find one or two places that you want to add some little element in, maybe you're not going to do micro quilting on the whole quilt, but maybe just those two or three spaces for that one block or this block. And that just really changes everything. So... Anyway, have a great week and it's been great being back and teaching again and sharing things with everybody. I did a live event in New Jersey and that was exciting. And I think, you know, a lot of quilters just want some community and we're, we're keeping it going virtual. For those people that, you know, are far away and just don't have the opportunity to travel, we're just going to try to keep the virtual education going too. So have a great week and happy quilting. Bye guys.